So welcome, welcome to Cross Point Community Church. We just sang that it's better to be in God's house, in his presence than anywhere else. So whether you have joined us in person or through one of our media plat platforms, we are so glad that you have joined us and we welcome you this morning. May you be blessed this morning by this service. Today, we are joined by Pastor Beth Fellinger, Resonant Global Missions Regional Leader for Eastern Canada. Beth, welcome. Thank you for being available to bring us God's word, and we pray that he will give you wisdom, clarity, words that you need to honorably answer his calling on your life today. So welcome, and I can't wait to see what happens when the ice melts. That's her topic of her message today. And a reminder that uh, next week we'll be having Lord's Supper um, that when Pastor Harold is back worshiping with us. And I guess without further ado, then we're going to uh, ask Beth to come forward. Good morning. It's wonderful to be with you in person again. And to, I'd love to say, see all your happy faces, um, but I'm seeing your eyes. That's good. <laughs> and I know God knows inside that there is wonderful things uh, for each of you today. So I pray that God would do great things in your lives. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God and King. Glorious and powerful is the God of all creation. And in reverent awe, we gather to worship him. The Lord our God is king and the just judge of all things for all eternity, all people and all places. And in reverent awe, we gather to praise God. The Lord our king is God. The Lord our God is king and the forgiving God. Fairness and justice are the names of our God. And in reverent awe, we gather to worship God within the light of God's holiness, justice, mercy, and love. Amen. Let's pray. God, you are Lord, and we gather today to give you thanks and praise your greatness. We praise your mighty works to the whole world. We praise you for your wonderful deeds. Your power is limitless. Your wisdom is unparalleled. Your grace is overwhelming. Your love is never failing. And you promise that you will never leave or forsake us. Let us worship you in spirit and in truth today. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. pray. 
We've been created by God to be loved by God and to receive our identity from him. So in this moment, let us pray. Heavenly Father, there are parts of our lives where we don't acknowledge you as Lord. And often we're unsatisfied with who you've made us to be. And we seek validation from others more than we seek it from you. Lord Jesus, there are parts of our lives where we don't want to acknowledge you as Savior. And often our first response to challenges in life is problem solving rather than prayer. And instead of being shaped by your cross, we try to avoid pain and suffering. And this disconnects us from our neighbors. Holy Spirit, there are parts of our lives where we don't look to you for hope. And often we fear the unknowns of the future. We put our hope in technology and education or celebrities. And we forget and don't believe anymore that you're working all things for good. Father, we come before you and acknowledge our weaknesses and our distraction. We believe and trust you, Lord. Help our unbelief. Renew us through your Holy Spirit and give us the same heart as Christ Jesus to love you with all of our hearts and love our neighbor as ourselves. Amen. In your assurance of pardon, sing, shout aloud, be glad and rejoice with all your heart. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. From Zephaniah. Thanks be to God. No.
Uh, when you entered, you've seen a couple of baskets on the table. Those are for our uh, financial givings. Um, the one basket is out there, and it's used uh, for Cross Point Community Church and uh, combined with un our classes, Ontario Southwest, and our denomination. And the deacons have highlighted the Salvation Army as, their, as for our second collection. Uh, we kind of partner with the Salvation Army um, because they're really good at helping the homeless and when people are hungry. So we send sometimes people from the community there for, uh, for help. Um, and since we send people there, we like to help them um, uh, with some of their expenses as well. Uh, we also sometimes, well, I think once a year, do a food drive for their pantry kitchen. So uh, remember those uh, two causes, and you can either use the baskets or you can donate online. We're going to have our, our, our prayer now for our congregation and community. So uh, will you pray? Dear Lord, we have been raising our voices in praise to you this morning. We profess that we belong to you that we aim to put you first in our lives above everything, health, riches, and family. We profess that you are first in every waking and sleeping hour, that all our ambitions, hopes, and dreams are surrendered into your hands. If we are perfectly honest with ourselves, this is a tall order, one we cannot do on our own strength. Humanly speaking, it's impossible for us, but with your help, we can become more like Jesus every day, drawing nearer and closer to perfect fellowship with you. In scripture, we read how you miraculously created the world and how you sustain it over hours and days and years. You provide for all the plants, animals, and humans upon the earth. Just as we trust in your faithfulness to send rain and sunshine for crops to grow, we trust in your faithfulness to work in the hearts of those to whom we bring the message of your saving grace. Help us to remember that our job is to spread the good news of salvation and that the work of turning their hearts toward you is yours. Father, we raise the needs of those among us who are ill, recovering from surgery or broken bones or those waiting for re test results. As we think especially of Emery. Sustain him for each day that you have for him on this earth and release his spirit to live with you in glory at your appointed time. Thank you for his ongoing testimony to your grace, even in his weakened condition. Thank you for continued healing that is experienced by Brandon, uh, Afka, Paul, and Marilyn, and others. Continue to mend their bones and strengthen weakened muscles and tissue. We think of those who struggle with mental health and anxiety, and all of us, really, who long for normal days to be back. This virus that we're dealing with has many, has many different effects in people's lives. Heal those who are sick from this virus, and we pray for calm to return and ask for respect for our governing authorities at all levels of government. We pray for an end to the divisiveness that is becoming more and more apparent. Thank you that we can partner with Salvation Army in their ministry to the hungry and homeless in our community. We pray for a blessing on the continued work as together we work to improve the lives of many. We are thankful for Pastor Harold's work among us, Lord. Sustain him and grant him strength and health as he leads this church to be a light in the community that you have placed us in here in Tilsonburg. We thank you for Pastor Beth and her work with Resonant Global Missions. Give her health, strength, and wisdom as she leads and advises ministries in Eastern Canada. We pray that you will bless her this morning with clarity of mind and speech as he teaches us from your word. We are thankful for our leadership team here at Crosspoint and for the individual growth in faith and grace that we experience as we lead this church. Thank you that though we are ill-prepared on our own to serve in this position, you provide us with wisdom in order to provide leadership for this church as we fulfill our calling in this place. We pray for open hearts and minds and your leading in the lives of individuals that will be approached to consider whether God is calling them to serve on church council. We pray that they will receive the support of their families that will allow them the necessary time for this work. 
We pray that those who are chosen to serve will receive a profound blessing as they answer the call to leadership. Thank you for this beautiful day in which you have in which we can worship you in a special way and rest from the grind of the day-to-day -day work. Help us to honor you in all we do today and to carry the message that we will hear into the, the week with us, working each day to become more and more like Jesus. Amen. Has anybody prepared a children's message? Or want to try it? Okay, I will pray for the children then as they leave for Sunday school. Heavenly Father, again, thank you for these little children that you have blessed us with. Thank you for the um, opportunity to uh, share Bible gospel messages with them. And we pray that they too might learn from your word and that they might be able to go home excited and be able to tell um, those who have taken them here of the good news of salvation and the stories that they hear there. Um, thank you for the leaders that will be teaching them this morning as well. As we pray in your name, amen. And we're singing in Christ alone. Before I read scripture, um, let me share a children's story with you that isn't a children's message, but I think you'll appreciate it because it's Valentine's Day. I have three grandkids who are two, five, and seven who are learning the books of the Bible right now. And their parents are trying to teach them that so Genesis is creation in the beginning and Exodus. So there's a meaning between behind each um, book as they're learning them. You know, and in my reasoning I said just learn the song because it'll make it easier but it was like nope they really want to just learn these books of the Bible so our seven-year-old has them all put together now our five-year-old as he was in the middle of them all um, decided uh, he got to Job's Psalms Proverbs Ecclesiastes and then he said 
songs of kissing, which sounded so much better than songs of Solomon. And uh, we decided that when he was 17, he might want to read that again. And uh, it's just fun watching them engage and uh, get so excited about it. But I want to share you a resonate story uh, before I preach. Um, just because I think it will excite you. This, I heard this story this week, uh, which makes it even um, more relevant. And I'm going to ask your prayers. So we know, how many of you have stayed up late to watch Olympic stuff? Any of you? A little bit of hockey, a little bit of, you know, the good stuff. Um, so Gary Timmerman was a, um, a missionary in Russia for 27 years. And um, for the sake of safety and for the sake of calling, uh, about a year ago, he came back to Canada to work with the Russian population uh, in Toronto and where there's over 300,000 Russians, probably one of the biggest areas outside of the Slavic community uh, where they live. Um, and so he's been meeting Russian pastors and he's been um, engaging. Um, and there was a group of Russian pastors who prayed together and then um, they got bent out of shape at one another. Someone was exuding too much power. You know, it sounds like church a little bit. So they stopped praying together um, in the process and then the pandemic hit, so that was a good excuse. But he said, he came across a book. He said, I knew the story, um, but I've just found this book that tells the story amazingly well. So in 1980, when the Olympics were happening uh, in Russia, in this one city, on this side of the street, the KGB office sat here. And across the street was a very large church. It had a really big steeple. And so the KGB was using the steeple of the church to block any kind of transmission uh, from going anywhere uh, so they could spy on people but no one could hear what was happening within their own communication lines. Um, and then the KGB decided to do something really amazing. They decided that there was no such thing as denomination anymore. So all of the Baptists, all of the Reformed, all of the Anglican, all of the United, anybody who had any kind of title all of a sudden became Baptist. You could only have one church. And at first some of them kind of went, well I don't want to you know, we all do that well. Um, and then they said, hmm, maybe this is an opportunity to work together. So instead, they all got together and became one church and started praying together. Um, and then they decided they would put on music concerts, which intrigued the young people in Russia. And what happened was a revival started in that church right across from the KGB. Um, and they let that go on for three years before they said no more Russian translation. Um, but at the time, the Olympics were happening, and the lake where all of the boating activities were supposed to be happening uh, was really close to the church. But people couldn't get to the Olympics because the trains were full of people going to the church. Does that just do something for your heart? So he's just read this book and discovered it. And so, as he's been working with these pastors in Toronto, he recognizes they need to hear that same story. And so he bought 23 copies of this book, um, and he's about to distribute them to the pastors in Toronto to remind them what it means to work together. And he's asking churches to pray um, that something begins to transpire in their hearts, and they remember the, what the core mission is all about. And I get to hear wonderful stories like that all the time. So even in the midst of everything, God is at work doing crazy, amazing wonderful things. Um, and if there was one other thing that I would share with you, I have the opportunity right now um, to work with two wonderful students from Redeemer who have become interns with me uh, for the next eight months, and they're going to learn everything about church planting that there is to know. Um, and it's exciting watching these very uh, wonderful, one of them who went through the South Coast Beach Project last year, uh, one who comes from one of our Ottawa churches but is living in Hamilton, and they're going to be the core, they're going to start the core team for a church plant that's about to take place in Hamilton uh, in the next year. So if you're interested in hearing any more about what it means to partner with young adults and students from Redeemer, talk to me afterwards. Let's read scripture. Hosea 10, 12 says, Sow righteousness for yourselves. Reap the fruit of unfailing love and break up your unplowed ground. 
for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. And in Isaiah, for as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all the nations. And our last scripture from Isaiah 43. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. The people I formed for myself that they may proclaim praise. And most of you will know, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Don't you perceive it? Can't you understand it is all part of that. The word of God to the people of God. I don't know about you, um, but a couple of years ago, back in 2020, does it feel like that long ago? There was an article that came out. When COVID started, um, when we were first hearing little rumors about China having this disease, um, I was in Germany with a group of people from Resonate as we were talking about mission around the world. And we thought, oh, we're in Germany, we're safe. <laughs> um, and then we realized it was gonna be like this two week thing and we're good with all of that. Needless to say, that's not what happened, but someone wrote an article, Andy Crouch wrote this article about how do you survive the blizzard? And he talked about three things. He talked about snowstorms, blizzards, and ice ages. Um, in a snowstorm, we all know what to do. We buy a shovel and toilet paper. Did we do well with that? Um, we knew how to get through that season because we knew it was only gonna be a couple of weeks, so we just bought a few things. And all of us know what to do in a blizzard. We buy milk and bread and toilet paper. Um, and we hunker down a little bit and we know that for a few weeks, life's gonna look a little bit weird, but we'll handle it. But when an ice age comes, we don't know what to do. Um, it's a long time. And um, one of the things that he said in the article that was kind of important or thought provoking was, if you're in an ice age, it means everything starts from scratch. It's brand new. Every business will be a new business. Every church will become a church plant. Um, every design of something is gonna look very different than it did before the ice age. And so we've all discovered that we have been in an ice age. There's no, you know, there's no um, doubt about that. But somehow, there is rumor that maybe we're going from pandemic to endemic, that maybe we're getting closer. Now, if there's anything that tells me this, a few years ago, uh, before we moved to St. Thomas, in our backyard was a pool when we lived in London, and we used to open it on the long weekend of May, and for the 10 years we lived in that house, five of them had a snowstorm in May. We were ready to go swimming. My kids still went in the pool, even though it was like 58 degrees because they had to prove something, um, but we thought it was all over, that there would be nothing else. We were into good weather. We'd start planting, life would be good. And sure enough, there would be one more snowstorm that would hit just to prove that Mother Nature um, has more control than we do. So even though we feel like we're kind of getting to the end of this story and that life is gonna switch, we know we're still up for grabs for what could happen next but it does feel like something is loosening. And so it made me start to think. Now, in some ways, I feel like I might be preaching to the choir because I think there are people who know gardening and farming and all those wonderful things. Um, so indulge my city life, even though I've hung out on my grandparents' farm. Um, it begs questions for me that I want to start looking at seed catalogs now for what's gonna be in my backyard. Um, I love my gardens and putting things in, but I have to start thinking about what it is that I want to harvest in the fall. What is it that I want to go inside my cold cellar? Um, what kinds of things do I want to put in jars that are going to make it through that will sustain us? And so I begin to think, okay, what do I need to do now so that I have something ready for hopefully the long weekend in May that will go in the ground outside so that there will be a harvest. And the more I thought about it, I realized it's really about what happens when the ice melts. 
we're going to prepare ahead of time so that when it melts, we're ready to go. I kind of feel like maybe sometimes the middle of this pandemic, the church at large has been more reactive than proactive. And I wonder if God is not calling us to a place to become proactive, to start thinking about what harvest we really want. So when you wake up in the morning and you're dreaming about what Tilsonburg looks like and this community looks like because of this congregation, what do you imagine? Are you imagining the same old, same old? Are you just getting through? Or do you have visions of how you've connected to your neighbor? Do you have visions about what it looks like that if you plant the right seeds now, the harvest you will get? It seems to me as you put this building into place and you added all this extra space, and I love that space out there, you were planting seed. You were thinking about the possibilities of what could be harvested in this space that wouldn't just affect you, but it would affect your neighbors and community as well. So I wonder if there's something in the heart of the story that God might be calling us to. When he says, break up the fallow ground, he knows it's hard. And I was having this conversation with a couple of pastors around what happens when the ice melts. And are we like gonna step into this? You know, my energy level was kind of going up. And then one of the pastors from Edmonton said, do you realize we get ice for six months? It doesn't go away. And he said, what happens under that ice is mold. Have you heard of pink mold or, you know, the stuff that's growing underneath? And he said, and then every spring when that ice begins to melt, he said, the smell is horrible. He said, the stench is awful from the mold that's been gathering underneath. And so he said, we have to get rid of that before we can grow. We have to get rid of the stuff. And so I think about my garden, and it doesn't look pretty in the spring either. There's a lot of guck that has formed um, in the beds that hold all of the vegetables and the flowers that we have to dig out and play with. And I think God might be saying, or challenging us as a church to think about, what does it mean to break up the fallow ground so that his righteousness will be seen and heard and felt? I think if I'm looking at the story around, well, Canada anyway, but around the world, I think the ice must be melting because there's a lot of ugly stuff right now. There's a lot of issues. There's a lot of people who need a Snickers bar that they become a little hangry in the process of all of this and they need a little bit more. There's something that is just shifting. And I wonder if maybe God is not opening the door to say it's time to break up the fallow ground. Now I see that in two ways. I see it as churches. How do we come together as churches and begin to pray? and to begin to seek God to say, God, we want to harvest, but we need to know what we're going to plant in the middle of this, and we need your direction, and we need your clarity, and if there's stuff that doesn't feel good, please help us get rid of it. Let's take out the weeds that have grown. Let's take out the stuff that's probably not exactly pretty, and we own it. But I'm wondering if that's not only a personal responsibility as well as a church responsibility. That something in my own heart has to shift if I'm going to sit with a group of other people to be able to say, we want to see God at work in the midst. And that's where the challenge comes and where it gets a little bit hard. God, what is in my heart that needs to be broken up? What have I become hardened to? What have I stopped believing in? How insular have I become? How polarized is my faith? Because I've just hung out and I'm tired. And it's been a long season. God, I believe that you still want to use your church in amazing ways and I want to be a part of it. So God, will you break up what's in my heart that will stop me from being part of the larger group. 
I think we get caught up in our own desires and our own thoughts and our own ways. I need it my way. My grandkids show me that on occasion. I need it my way. But I see it in the church and somehow something triggers in my brain that the one who gave his life for us, the one who went to a cross on our behalf was giving up his rights. How dare we hang on to our rights? Is this a moment that if we're gonna follow Jesus in anything, we need to say we wanna honor how you lived it to the cross and we're gonna follow you, even if it's hard, even if it takes work. You know, um, just this week I heard a podcast that was done years and years ago between Billy Graham and David Maines on Huntley Street and someone had posted it. And Billy Graham was talking about what he believed was the essential gift of Canada for revival. And if the church would just come under the authority of Jesus and walk it out, Canada would be a different place. And I was intrigued by what he was saying because I know that in 1976, 1978, Young Gi Cho, the largest Korean pastor, um, also had a prophetic word over Canada, saying that he was saving Canada for such a special time in history that when the move of God in Canada came, it wouldn't just affect Canada, but it would affect the world. And I don't know that we're getting anything completely right at the moment, but there are a lot of eyes on Canada right now. And I begin to wonder, is the church beginning to even dream about what it means to break up the hardness in our hearts and in our lives so that we might plant something new? That when the ice melts, we're ready to go. And we're not scrambling to figure out what's next. We've already anticipated that God is far bigger than we are that he's the one who brings the seasons. He's the one that knows what's coming next. And I know that every spring when the ice melts in my backyard, I know that the plants are going in. I anticipate that. I think about those things. I think it's time for the church to think about what does it mean to begin to plant seeds? Now, I can't say this to you and not have something in my own life um, as an illustration. Many of you know about our crazy blue picnic table that sits in our yard. Um, and I know that we have been planting intentional seeds with the neighborhood, but I had no idea just how many seeds were being planted. So um, we're still not being, my picnic table is a little covered in snow at the moment. It has snowmen sitting at it so that it looks cute to the neighborhood, but it's really hard to sit at right now. And I can't have people in my house because we've had too many restrictions about the numbers up until just very recently. So I thought we have to do something still to keep the neighborhood moving and you know feeling okay. And so we have a Facebook group um, where we have been interacting uh, through the process. And um, in February, for tomorrow, um, I threw a contest for my neighbors on Facebook and um, in the process of this, I'm going to make meals for 20 people tomorrow um, who won the dinners for Valentine's Day that they can share with their families. And, you know, uh, it's a crazy day in my world, um, but I just couldn't imagine. And so, you know, we've handed out these five meals. This week, we were putting together the person who was going to win the fifth meal. And so I sent her a thing saying, tell me the allergies of your family, how many are in your household, you know, all those things. And she said, no allergies, but I have a story for you. She said, I want you to know that you're part of our family even though you don't know that you are. And I was like, oh, I'm intrigued. And she wrote me this very long story. They have a son who's four. His name is Riker. He's been through more surgeries than anyone has a right to at his young age, um, which has left some issues for him to have to deal with along the way. And she said, he's been pretty nonverbal uh, in the process. And she said, but in July, when you decided to have Christmas in July in your neighborhood and you put the ice cream truck at the end of your laneway, we decided we needed to come. And we didn't know what it was going to be like for him because we weren't sure how that would interact. And my husband dressed up like Santa in Bermuda shorts and a jacket 
to say that Santa was on holidays and he was coming to join us. And they said, we didn't know what he would do with that either. Anyway, she said that morning something kind of just shifted or it felt like it had shifted and he got in the wagon and he stayed in the wagon all the way from our house to yours. And when we got to your house, we didn't know what he'd do. And then we watched him and he got out of the wagon and he went straight to your husband and he started talking. And I don't know how many times Riker didn't go back and he and Barry like spent probably two hours together and he'd walk away and he'd come back. She said, that began a new journey in our house. And I just have to let you know what a difference you've made in our family. Um, and that we're seeing this openness of our son that we hadn't seen before. And I cried. Um, and so I sent her an email back saying, you made me cry. And I said, I understand some of your story because we have a five-year-old grandson who has sensory processing disorder. And we're respite care for him. And I know that there are good days and rough days. Um, so I understand some of your pain and I, you know, and she sent an email back saying, I'm crying now because most people don't know what SPD is. And she said, we're just waiting on the diagnosis. So I'm gonna get to introduce them to my son-in-law and daughter and our grandson. We didn't know that was a seed we were planting at that point. We just knew we needed to connect to our neighbors to show them the love of Jesus. That was the seed we wanted to plant. But when you get to hear those kinds of stories, I can hardly wait to see what God has in mind for the rest of this journey. And tomorrow when we deliver a meal to them, I get one more opportunity to hang out into their story and into their life in very cool ways. My husband cried too when he heard it because it's so important. Um, but I have to tell you in the middle of this, what we think is fallow ground really needs to be broken up and thought of differently. And I remember when our grandson got his diagnosis that we were the cool grandparents who were praying, God, make it whole, make it real, you know, give them, I don't know what normal is anymore, but help them so it's not so much of a challenge. We were trying, I think in some ways, to pray away um, his SPD. And my husband was in the car one day, had worship music on, and he's just, you know, singing along. And he heard God say, do you know when you pray for Ben? And Barry was like, yeah. He said, stop it. Barry was like, what? He said, I gave Ben a gift that will be used by me, and you're trying to take away the very gift I gave him. You're in the middle of the weeds right now, and it's a hard journey. But what I have for him, you have no idea. And this will be the best thing that he will ever use to be the influence. And he will see things for people that others will never see. My husband came home and we cried together. And we shared that story uh, with our daughter and son-in-law. And I realized sometimes God places people in our lives in very cool ways so that different seeds can be planted. And if I'm at all correct, you never plant corn every year the same way because you plant corn and then you plant wheat and then you plant corn and wheat so that you don't destroy the soil that's underneath. Um, it's the same thing in churches. Sometimes we've planted things in one way and we've just thought that's the only way we can do it. And then I read scriptures like Isaiah that says, behold, I want to do a new thing, which means he's saying, can you rethink what seeds you're going to plant? What is different about our world now than it was three years ago? So what is it that you need to do as a church? What do we need to do as a community of believers that looks different? And so my challenge today is, as this ice begins to melt, will we own the junk underneath and ask God to clean the junk out so that our witness to the community is good? and smell sweet. I love driving through country roads when the fields have been taken off and you can just smell the hay and you can just smell the stuff. There's something that's sweet about that. My challenge is not in this scripture, but in another one that seems to fit for me. I'm thinking about Acts 1.8. There's a group of disciples who have been through the worst They've seen the crucifixion of Jesus, 
He's arisen, but somehow in the back of their head, they're still remembering. And they say things like, so now is the time we're going to get rid of the Romans? Now is the time you're going to put your kingdom together? When is this all going to fit? It's like, have you missed everything over the last number of days? You still want to go back to this story. Can I share a new one with you? It's none of your business. <laughs> Only God knows what day. But what I want to do for you is I want to send you the Holy Spirit so that you can be empowered to be, and this is the word, I want you to be my witnesses. He doesn't say, perhaps you'll be witnesses, or maybe you'll think about being a witness. He said, no, I'm doing this so that you will be witnesses. So my question is, what kind of witness are we? Are we grouchy, whiny witnesses who are trying to protect this? Or are we the witness that has planted seed so that the world might see the fruit? God wants to make us fruit bearers. He's created each of you and me with very unique designs and gifts. I love how we're not the same. I love how we're not like snowflakes or that we're like snowflakes and that each of us has our own unique ability to be exactly who God created us to be. But it means I have to think about who God created me to be and what is it that I need to plant in my heart and in my story to be the best witness I can be so that collaboratively my gifts and your gifts and your gifts all work together to bring the witness of Jesus to a world who so desperately needs to hear the truth. There's a lot of people who are stuck by the ice right now. But I don't know about you, do you feel the shift? Do you feel it maybe starting to dissipate a little bit? Do you feel like maybe we're almost at the next season that spring, so to speak, is on the way? I don't know about you, but when I plant things, I get so excited when I see this much green because I know something has taken root. I know something is going to grow out of that, and I need to tend it, and I need to take care of it and water it and do all of those things. And then in the fall, or as whatever season it takes, and I start picking tomatoes that I easily could have bought in the store for probably less, but not with the same accomplishment. And then I look at the peppers, and I look at the next thing, and I think, I have the ability to create because I planted seed. Can you imagine today what would happen if you began to think proactively about the harvest you want for Tilsonburg, for this community? Every time I drive in and I see more houses going in, I just think the potential <laughs> is beyond imagination. And you have a God. You have a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper, a light in the darkness that wants to shine through you. So as the ice begins to melt, can you imagine with me what seeds need to grow and what kind of harvest God is calling you to reap? When he says the harvest is ready and there are few workers, what he's saying is, I'm going to bring a harvest. Will you be there to help me? Will you be there to express joy and celebration? I think we have a moment to reflect on our seasons. I'm going to suggest this week that you pull out your seed catalog. I think it's called a Bible. And you begin to read. And you begin to imagine. And you begin to recognize once again who God is. He's still the same, even in the middle of the tough stuff. And he has great things yet to do. 
He has amazing things that he would like to do in your life, in your family, your church family, and in your community. Will you join him? You might even want to go to the dollar store this week because I know they're ready for spring. They change really well. Go buy a kid's shovel and hang it somewhere in your house to remind you it's time to start digging up the fallow ground so that the righteousness of Jesus will reign. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for the chance to imagine. God, I pray that at this moment you would drop into the hearts of each person here what kinds of seeds could be planted. God, I pray that you would help us break up the fallow ground that sometimes stops us from planting. God, today, may we begin to play in the dirt. That we can imagine in our minds what it's going to look like. And God, I pray for that space on the other side of the glass. <laughs> that the moments of opportunity to share the love of Jesus with others will be immense. That the harvest will be great and that many will come to know Jesus because of open doors and inviting space. Thanks for those seeds. God, we love you, and we can hardly wait to be prepared for when the ice melts. In your name, Jesus, amen. Martin Luther once said, even if I knew the world was going to pieces, I'd still plant my apple tree. My prayer for you this morning is that you will have the courage to plant your apple tree, knowing that the righteousness of Jesus reigns with you, knowing that he loves you, that he wants to give you absolutely everything. May you go today knowing that there is no place so deep that he hasn't already been there first. And go knowing that there is no place so high that he hasn't already been there waiting for you. And there is no place too wide that his arms extended on a cross did not include you. He loves you. Go in his favor. Go in his grace. Go with his righteousness covering you today. Amen.